Good morning, everybody. Here in the room and online, it's welcome to day three of Creative Brain Week. And the theme this morning is going to be neuroscience and creativity. My name is Brian Lawler. I'm Deputy Executive Director of the Global Brain Health Institute here at Trinity College Dublin and Professor of Old Age Psychiatry. I'd like to introduce my co-chair. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Mani, Mani Ramaswamy. So I am a professor of uh, genetics and also in the Institute of Neuroscience. Over the last five years, I've run a, a Wellcome Trust funded a program on the neurohumanities, which is an effort to connect, which acknowledges that uh, all experiences of humans are actually are, are, are through the brain. And so it's an effort to connect uh, neuroscience to the arts, uh, the humanities, and, uh, and, uh, and other as and social and, um, and history and other aspects of human experience. So in this capacity, I'm extremely happy that, um, that Brian and others at GBHI have asked me to co-chair this and uh, with this very nice uh, group of speakers. So this morning we have three neuroscientists and I think we're going to get under the hood of the brain science of creativity. We're going to talk about models and the relationship to art and where memory comes in. And hopefully we'll get to a better understanding of, of the neuroscience of creativity and how we might be able to tap in to enhance everyone's creativity for our own sense of well-being. So, as I say, we have three speakers, two here in the room and one will be streaming in live. And I, first of all, I'd like to introduce Professor Richard Roach who's Associate Professor of Psychology at Maynooth University. And he's going to speak to us about arts and, neuros and neuroscience and why science needs arts. Over to you, Richard. Great. Um, thanks, Brian, for the lovely introduction. Morning, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about art and science and art and the brain. And events like this are fantastic because they help to break down an imaginary barrier that's in a lot of people's minds about arts and sciences. Um, it can seem like the two are at disparate ends of a spectrum, but the reality is these two endeavors, these two journeys towards knowledge, have actually a long history together, and it, they aren't as disparate as they might seem. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about this shared history, and then I'll talk more specifically about art and neuroscience. And towards the end, we'll touch on the idea of neuroaesthetics and what art can tell us about how the brain actually functions. So if we look historically, there was a time when art, and particularly visual art and drawings and diagrams and representations, were fundamental to scientific discovery. We can go back to the illustrations and anatomical drawings of da Vinci during the Renaissance, whose incredible reproductions of what he observed on the anatomy table really helped to advance our understanding of human anatomy. And the same is true of Galileo's watercolors of the surface of the moon. So at the time, the only way really to represent what people were observing <laughs> through the lens of a telescope or on the anatomy table or through a microscope was to physically hand draw or hand paint them and reproduce them in this way to demonstrate what could be observed in this scientific uh, endeavor. This was also true of other disciplines. We see examples in botany with these fantastic watercolors and paintings from Maria, <coughs> excuse me, Maria Marion and also Ellen Hutchins, who contributed massively to our understanding and categorization of different types of flora in the early decades of the advancement of botany. The same is true of Genevieve Jones, who produced these fantastic paintings of different birds and birds' nests with the associated branches of the trees that they came from, which again helped enormously in cataloging the different varieties of birds' eggs and birds' nests. And Beatrix Potter is another lovely example. So aside from inventing Peter Rabbit, she also contributed fantastically to the study of mushrooms and fungi with these watercolors of different types of mushrooms. Now, all those examples are of single cases, so single observations, single case studies, or single examples that the scientists reproduced in these artistic forms. But it's also true that artistic or visual formats have been used to display multiple observations or larger data sets. And one of the first examples of this is from Florence Nightingale, 
who invented these, she called them rose diagrams, to depict the types of ailments and injuries and maladies that were suffered from, uh, the different soldiers suffered from during her time serving in the Crimean War. This is one of the very earliest examples of data visualization. Here's another lovely example from Alexander von Humboldt, his painting slash diagram of Mount Chimborazo, which is simultaneously a depiction of the mountain, but also a diagram of the different climatic regions, the different geological features, the different flora and fauna that you find at different levels of the mountain. So this is simultaneously art and science in the one image. Now, when we come to neuroscience, again, there's a long history of art and brain speaking to each other and informing each other. And again, we can look at da Vinci. Now, he had been working on an anatomy textbook, which was never published in his lifetime. But as part of that, he again produced some fantastic illustrations and drawings of the brain and the skull. But probably more famous is the textbook of Andrea Vesalius, so the famous Belgian anatomist who produced what's effectively the first human anatomy textbook, De Corpore Humani Fabricus, in, uh, in the Renaissance. And again, he had these marvelous diagrams and drawings of the human brain during his anatomical researches. Of course, when we talk about neuroscience, we have to talk about Cajal, the founding father of modern neuroscience. And we know that Cajal spent long hours staring through the lens of his microscope at these slices of brain tissue, which had been stained with the Golgi stain technique. And he would observe for hours through the microscope the structure of these neurons, and then hand draw from memory these fantastic diagrams of what he observed through the lens. And it'll probably come as no surprise that as a child, Cajal originally wanted to be an artist, uh, and it found his way into his scientific work later with these fabulous diagrams that he produced. And even in more modern neuroscience approaches, we see techniques like the brainbow, where cells are stained with fluorescent chemicals, which allow the structure of these neurons to be visualized very clearly for us to, to study and also to appreciate. And this has led to a whole field of art in neuroscience, pioneered by people like Greg Dunn, who has produced these fantastic dynamic and static images of different parts of the brain, which really highlights the overlap between art and science in the artistic side of the spectrum. And his work is really well worth checking out. It's fantastic, uh, fantastic work. Now, we can also think of art and artistic output as a window into some of the functions of the brain. For example, there are very rare people who have a condition known as tetrachromacy. So most people have three types of cone cells in the retina of their eye. And these are tuned to red, green, and blue color spectra. But tetrachromats have a fourth type of cone cell, which allows them to perceive something in the region of 100,000 more colors than the rest of us. And several tetrachromats have become artists and tried to depict their visual world in the form of paintings. So this is an example from Conchetta Antico, who has produced paintings like this one, Rainbow Gully, to demonstrate the type of experience she has when she looks at what we might see as just an area of green grass. She sees a plethora of different colors. Synesthesia is another fantastic uh, condition where people have a crosstalk between the sense modalities. It's highly likely that Kandinsky was a synesthete. Uh, many of his paintings he talks of in terms of representing sounds and colors or shapes and what he perceived when he listened to particular types of music. So in this example, he referred to, say, the, the circular shapes maybe as representing percussion, the angular ones representing strings, for example. So it's highly likely he was a synesthete. We know for definite that Tim Layden and Svetlana Rudenko are synesthetes. And a few years ago, we organized an event here in, in Trinity in the College Chapel where Tim live painted what he sees while Svetlana performed on the piano. So we had a live painting of his visual experience in response to Svetlana's music, which again is a lovely example of art and science talking to each other. Another well-known synesthete is Carol Steen, who has over five different types of synesthesia. And this is a painting of what she experiences visually when the needles are removed during an acupuncture session. Now, she has many different types, but many of them she represents as artwork or dynamic artworks. 
But artistic output can also reveal things about what happens when the brain changes or degenerates in certain conditions. And some of you will have seen these paintings here uh, many years ago in the Science Gallery from William Uttermolen. So Uttermolen was diagnosed with dementia, and over the, the years since his diagnosis, he continued to paint and produce self-portraits. And you can see over the years from age 62 onwards, a uh, gradual deterioration in the quality, in the form, in the structure of his paintings, and also in the color palette that he uses. So this allows us to track the degeneration of his brain under the, the conditions of his dementia. The same is true of Carolus Horn, who painted the same scene before and after the onset of his dementia. And we can see a difference in his ability to represent perspective, a change also in his color palette, and generally a much more cartoonish representation in his latter painting. Another really interesting example is Anton Raderscheid. So Raderscheid was a famous German artist who suffered a right hemisphere stroke in 1967. And afterwards, he was left with a profound left unilateral neglect, or left hemi-neglect. And this is a condition where you're basically unable to perceive anything on the left side of your visual world. Now, over the following two years, he forced himself to produce a self-portrait every month for the next two years. And what we can see is gradually, he was able to regain a lot of his function in perceiving or recognizing what was on the left side of his visual world. And this is a lovely example of brain plasticity in action, of how the brain, even following quite catastrophic damage, tries to, to fix itself, to repair itself spontaneously over time. And we can see the dramatic change from early to late self-portraits, even within a two-year period. These are clues to the mechanisms or the function of brain plasticity at work. We can also look to changes in an artist's style as a result of brain injury or brain insult, like a stroke. So in this example, Lovis Corinth, who suffered a stroke sometime after 1911, had a dramatic change from being quite impressionistic to quite expressionistic in his artistic outputs. And again, this is attributed to a left hemisphere stroke, which he suffered in between these two paintings. We also see cases where people who wouldn't have produced much artistically before the onset of a stroke suddenly have a change in style, but also become incredibly productive. So this case of patient JN, who had painted minimally before their stroke, following their left hemisphere stroke, they produced a huge volume of work and showed a dramatic change in their artistic style. And again, this is attributed to damage to the left hemisphere due to that uh, left prefrontal cortex stroke. And there are also very rare cases where people who've never painted before, never picked up a brush or a pencil, have suddenly become artistically inclined and produced artworks following a stroke or left hemisphere injury. And again, this is the case with patient MB, who never painted before, but suddenly following their stroke, began to produce these uh, fantastic pieces of art. So these are all examples of how Artworks can give us clues to what the brain is doing and what's happening in the human brain. But there's also an area of neuroaesthetics, which tries to understand what the brain is doing when we appreciate or when we observe or look at different pieces of art. And this has given us various clues as to how the brain operates. And one of these interesting features is the fact that the brain loves to fill in a gap. It loves something unfinished. So examples like the Venus de Milo, or the Rondonini Pieta, which was unfinished by Michelangelo. These are fascinating to the brain because our brain spontaneously loves to complete something that's incomplete. So this is one of the principles of neuroaesthetics that's been suggested. And we can see examples of this in Cezanne's paintings towards the end of his career. So these are four paintings of the same mountain in France, but later in his career, Cezanne effectively doesn't even paint the mountain, the mountain itself. He leaves a gap, he leaves a space for us to fill in the space where the mountain actually is. And we can see this in works of Turner as well, where this sunset, there's effectively almost nothing there. We're left to invent or suggest or imply the presence of the setting sun and the horizon. What's really interesting is when we study the network involved in artistic or aesthetic appreciation in the brain, it seems to activate a set of regions that we call the default mode network which is associated with when the brain is effectively idling or in a state of not being particularly focused. And what's interesting is the same network is implicated with autobiographical memory. 
So this might suggest why in some cases in a gallery or in a museum, we're almost transported back in time to an event of our past, or we feel like we sort of drift away to another location. The same network seems to be implicated. So, to finish up, I think it's really important to have events like this one, which really highlight the fact that arts and sciences are really not so far away from each other, and they have a lot to say to each other, which makes events like Creative Brain Week so important. And it shows us, I think, and highlights that art can really reveal interesting things about the brain, about the normally functioning brain, about the brain when there are problems or degeneration or following damage. And these are more than just interesting anecdotes. The fact that in many of these cases, the damage suffered to people has been in the left hemisphere suggests that there might be some sort of inhibitory function in left frontal regions, which is removed by that damage, which then frees up these artistic leanings among people. So I'm going to stop there. If you're interested in these topics and want to know more about them, we had a book several years ago with Francesca and Sean, so feel free to follow up on that. And I'll thank you for your attention, and I'll back to Brian. Great. Thank you very much, Richard. <laughs> and, uh, we should have an opportunity for questions at the oh. end. Oh, sorry. So I'm delighted now to introduce our second speaker, who is going to give a, a different perspective. Uh, this is a neuroscientist, Agustin Ibanez. Um, he is the director of BrainLat at the Universidad of uh, uh, Adolfo Ibanez in Santiago in Chile. He's also a research associate professor here at Trinity College Dublin. So can we have Agustin? Hey, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hola. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, good morning from the beautiful Colombia, South America. It's a pity I cannot be there, but uh, I am really honored to join this incredible panel. And I will share my screen. Let me know if you can see that. So um, thank you, Richard, for such a great uh, talk about uh, uh, art and science. So you have made my work more easy. So why neuroscience? I will talk about neuroscience and creativity. So the brain is the most complex organ that exists. And creativity is perhaps one of the most fundamental and unique abilities of humankind. So how is the relation between this two perspective is that I am going to try to talk. And uh, first of all, let me uh, introduce how neuroscience deal with this huge challenge to understand creativity. So um, neuroscience is a multi multidisciplinary effort that uses different approaches from this, for instance, for genetics, uh, we try to understand, for instance, what genes or what combination of genes predispose whether creativity. We also use genetics to understand the gene expression in the brain, for instance, like the case of synesthesia that uh, Richard presented. So we can see how multimodal regions in the brain are connected through special genetic conditions in, in some cases. But the most typical way to understand beyond also animal behavior that is used you know, for understanding uh, um, behavior that are related to creativity. Uh, we use a um, um, device that can measure different aspects of the brain while the people is doing a specific task. In this case, tasks related to creativity. I will give you an example of, of my lab. So we invited, we, we were interested in understanding the expertise of tango dancers, how they become experts and what uh, make at brain level this expertise. So we invited um, uh, top expert tango dancers from Argentina and we compare it with uh, uh, beginners. And we invited to see videos of other tango dancers. And some cases in those videos, they were subtle errors in the steps. And we ask the, the participant to say if they, they identify some con something that is congruent or incongruent. And while, while we recorded the brain activity, we identified that frontal regions were able to anticipate their roles only in the expert brains uh, before they appear. And they use also semantic networks, like language network to understand the steps. This specific activity was not observed in, in non-experts. We also find that the brain networks were involved in 
in the action observation of this uh, distance were really, really specific in the experts, and they were more similar across experts than in beginners. And we also used the brain activity to decode the level of expertise. So we were able to 100% accurately predict uh, if one brain was from an expert or not an expert while they were uh, viewing this. Uh, so this is an example of how you can uh, understand how the expertise helped to anticipate uh, and ide better identify the specific content of the world that is coming from the expertise, how the brain networks are more uh, fine-tuned to understand or to characterize the, the artistic process and how the brain activity is quite powerful to distinguish between experts and non-experts. But when we look at the thousand of experiment that has been performed across different uh, levels of creativity, uh, we must say that we don't have a theory of, of a framework yet. This is something that shouldn't be some uh, something really strange as neuroscience is a quite novel um, enterprise that has been, you know, uh, finding a lot of problems just to characterize small dots of cognition. So creativity is as a whole, is not easy uh, to understand yet. We are just starting to understand this process. And we have been trying from the start to trying to understand creativity as a monolithic process. And uh, now, now we realize that we have so many different aspects related to creativity and so many cognitive process from you know, cognitive working memory, divergent thinking, emotions, um, expertise level, the study of history scale, the neuroesthetics, or a specific tasks that I, are designed to understand creativity. So, in, with that regards, we need to do a lot yet to understand the brain of creativity. But let's start for, for avoiding some myths and limitation of neuroscience. So, first of all, um, in earlier stage of creativity studies of neuroscience, uh, um, they, have, they have been proposed in single association, you know, like the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex or the temporal cortex or any specific part of the cortex is, you know, the site for creativity. This has been induced a lot of fallacies, like the meteorological fallacy or a metonymic way to understand the property of one brain area, you know, regarding creativity. Creativity is not a thing, it's a huge process. So we need to understand a uh, different stage of creativity, a uh, different uh, specific aspect of creativity, visual creativity, for instance, you know, or, or auditory creativity or a spe more specific process. You know, the left and right association with an intellectual brain versus a creative brain is a myth. Doesn't mean that we can understand a specific, you know, contribution of the right uh, brain to the creativity, but creativity is really more complex than a process that involves both sides. And also, uh, we tend to have sometimes um, single reduction in explanations. The brain is a situated organ that have a body, uh, have a culture, and we need to understand in this non-reductionistic uh, framework. So we, we also have some idealistic assumptions about uh, mental health. You know, in general, we tend to think that during mental health, we are more creative. And this is the case of some specific situation, but, you know, famous artists like Van Gogh were less creative when they have a higher level of mental illness. And we don't have this kind of uh, uh, linear association between disease, between disease and creativity. And the most important thing, when you look at the brain areas that are involved in creativity, you will find that those areas are involved in many other things. Uh, so we need to really move forward and starting to understand different type of creativity and using a more less reductionistic uh, approach to neuroscience. So the study of brain network, as Richard mentioned before, like the default, net, default mode network, are important way to starting to understand how the brain as a whole is involved in, in creative tasks. So for instance, uh, the combination of the executive network, a network that is involved in, in the control of behavior and the thoughts, the salience network, a network that is mainly involved in the, you know, in the relevance of external and internal stimuli and the default mode network, which is involved when we don't do nothing, are interweaved together in the creative process. So, for instance, when we start to think about creative aspects, 
uh, we use the full network, like the imagination network, and the executive network become slow down, you know, because we don't need to control that. The salience network uh, is involved in the identification of uh, inside aspects, and when we uh, we change from a flow state when we have less executive control towards a more productive uh, stage, we increase the executive control network. This kind of approach has been used to understand a specific stage of creativity, and we are just starting to understand this uh, uh, complex process. But beyond that, I think that there are huge opportunities for neuroscience and creativity. So the first of all, the first thing is even when you can find small dots in the brain that are directly involved in a specific aspects of, of domain expertise or a specific creative creativity process, uh, the entire brain contributes to creativity and to cognition. So this is important to understand, to move forward uh, towards more holistic approaches. Uh, and plasticity is another thing, you know, not only brain disease have shown the change, the negative plastic, plastic change that happened in the brain, and you can track these different um, creative moments across different uh, brain stage of the disease, but also, you know, because when you do something repetitively, and when you uh, pay attention to that, you create brain plasticity. So any learning process is a plasticity process and creativity has been starting to show how change the brain. Um, the other thing is, it's more easy to understand creativity regarding a specific domain. So painters have a specific visual processing, you know, dancers have a specific motor or sensory motor and brain adaptations and we, we, th this is a shortcut to understand creativity, I would say. But then we have huge um, theoretical approach to understand uh, creativity. One thing that I love to understand is the idea of predictive coding. It's a kind of universal theory in the, in the neuroscience coming in the last 20 to 30, 30 years old, that try to understand how the brain anticipates the needs of the world and the body by creating an internal uh, model of the world. And this is doing but two things, you know, like, like the anticipation of external stimuli, but also the internal body states. How your interoceptive signal, the sensing of your own body states, your emotional self-regulation, your um, intrinsic, your universe within, is used to balance the responses uh, to external stimuli, and this has been used to understand the allostatic overload or, or the response, the stressful responses to environmental stimuli. But it can be also used to understand how the individual creates their own subjective or intersubjective representation of the world and interacting with the world. In that regard, the brain becomes more embodied, more situated in a body, in a culture, and in a specific situation. And this opens a huge opportunity to understand how neuroscience can interact with other disciplines and, and how we can move forward from <coughs> basic reductionistic explanation towards more um, um, multi-level or, or pluralistic explanatory levels of the creativity. And this can be used a lot so we can understand the expertise of the art and we can maybe use in the future to teach or to understand more subtle aspects of creativity as Richard uh, introducing neuroaesthetics can help us to understand what uh, one specific piece of art has as unique you know creation but at the same time how different individuals perceives and reacts to those in a very individual way also help us to understand that the brain is not a rational organ, uh, that we have a, a, a huge interaction between emotions uh, and cultures and body uh, when we think and we, we are creators. Uh, regarding psychopathology, I think that there's a trade-off. We can understand how the disease uh, impacts the creativity by brain changes, but also we can use creativity to enhance, you know, um, uh, more healthy behaviors across psychopathology. And non-invasive brain stimulation has been just starting to help us to understand how, you know, by 
externally uh, stimulating the brain, we can create change uh, that impact in creativity. And also, I think that in a more broad sense, uh, brain capital is, you know, the unique abilities that machines doesn't have, that technology won't be provided. And I think that the pandemic times has been teach us how important and the unique human aspect, like, you know, uh, creative thinking, uh, flexibility, um, social uh, decision making, and this kind that make us humans. So we should put the focus in the education and economy, and not only in the health, uh, when we think about the brain capital, the opportunities that we as human can, uh, you know, bring to be more creative. And last but not least, uh, I just want to mention that while we study the um, neuroscience of creativity, we can use art to support health, as is the case of a kind of pilot studies that we are creating with Senior Atlantic Fellows, Dominic uh, Campbell, Patricia Spinoza, and, and J Johnny Miller, just to, you know, identify people that have been used art to um, create better conditions and having a better healthy life and helping other in very vulnerable population. And the case of this two musicians that are teaching forehand guitars, exceptional guitarists, to children under vulnerable con uh, conditions in the small town of San Juan, Argentina. So, thank you so much. So, thank you, Augustine. And just for people here in the room, there's uh, the beautiful artwork and photography outside from Alex Kornberger and, and Johnny Miller. You'll be able to look at that perhaps at the break and be able to see that. So I'll just hand over now to my co-chair, uh, Manu Ramaswamy. Okay, so the, uh, the next speaker of this session is uh, Tomas Ryan. Tomas is one of our, our Trinity College's uh, star young neuroscientists. Among the things, he's, he's an associate professor in biochemistry and immunology. He's also um, one, among the first groups to have um, identified sort of the physical basis of the concept of n-grams, which is groups of neurons that are thought to encode memories. Uh, Tomas is not only uh, an, an outstanding neuroscientist, is also involved, uh, interested in philosophy, in um, in, uh, in and, and in public engagement in science, and would be a look forward to stuff. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Let's try to see how to get the slides. Okay. Wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Um, I was asked to give this talk on the neuroscience of creativity, obviously relating to this panel discussion on the intersection of neuroscience and art. Um, and because this is a public forum, I think it's important to make two disclaimers with respect to how we can study the interaction between those two things. The first is that neuroscience is really aside from the other areas of biological sciences, in that we really don't know how the brain works. Whereas as biologists, we understand in broad terms how every other organ or system in the body works. We really are still in the dark about how the brain itself works. But we know what it does, more or less. What the brain does is to enable behavior as an animal and, and to enable thought uh, if you're a human of course, thought is there to make your behavior more adaptive, even if that behavior is moving your tongue so that you can speak. With respect to creativity, I'm not sure that we have a coherent scientific definition of what we mean by creativity. Um, I suppose from my perspective, creativity is what we call the formation of new ideas that are useful at a given point in time. Um, and I think what science and art have in common, to a very large extent from a socio-political perspective, is that we're forced to judge the value of something in real time. We're forced to judge the value of a piece of art or a piece of science within the framework of a couple of years, uh, which of course is something that we as industries spend 
a large amount of time on. But those kind of judgments can sometimes be misleading. And it seems to me that the real value of a piece of artwork can only be borne out over years, if not decades, just as it is with scientific discoveries. And the real question is not how much a particularly famous scientist or institution or academy thinks that this piece of work is important, but really how useful is it? So in science, that means what is the predictive value of a theory? And in art, it presumably means, what, from my perspective, um, how it is useful to the observer um, in understanding something about themselves or the world or the thing that they're considering. My fundamental interest in this interface is, is what is a representation. So I really want to know what is it in our brains that is holding something meaningful about the world that we inhabit. Um, and it seems to me that from a human neuroscience perspective, uh, that neuroaesthetics and understanding uh, different aspects of the arts, about the, uh, particularly those types of artwork that focus on the interaction of the self and the other. I think uh, in theater, most, most notably, um, I think, uh, accentuated by the works of Samuel Beckett, are going to be very important in the future for refining the kinds of ideas we have about mind and brain. But my own work, uh, my own everyday work, focuses on the neuroscience of memory. So me and my research group, we study how information is stored in the brain in the long term. So we want to understand what is the difference between your brain before and after you learn something. And the difference between your brain before and after you learn something, we assume is going to be contributing to the material basis of information storage. So how does this relate to, to creativity? Um, well, memory, we often think as being a very fixed thing. We think of it as being a very sort of rigid thing. Um, and that's probably because we're informed by metaphors from computer science. But the brain is nothing like a computer. The brain is an organ that evolved. And it deals with memory in a very reconstructive way. And I think this was very well illustrated in 1932 by the Cambridge psychologist Frederick Bartlett, who published this monograph called Remembering, where he showed how people who have very similar experiences will recreate them very differently from their own memory, whether it's telling a narrative story or redrawing a visual thing that they've seen. And that memory had a very large interpretive component. And that interpretive component was subjective to the individual. In other words, a particular human is going to remember the same experience differently than another human. OK, so this really shed a light on how memory is descriptive, how memory is something that is not fixed, but is interpreted with respect to the environment. And this kind of perspective has been borne out by modern neuroscience research. Um, people studying the human cognitive neuroscience of memory have shown quite clearly that the brain regions that a human uses when they are trying to remember episodic experiences are the same brain regions that they're using when they're trying to imagine hypothetical new experiences. Um, and this has been shown by imaging studies, but also by studying people who may have lesions in these particular brain regions. OK, so it seems that the process of imagination and the process of remembering are quite similar at uh, a neurobiological level, at least to the way we can see it using modern methodologies. The other side of memory is forgetting. And what I want to bring in this talk, if you walk away from this with one key message, um, it's the idea that forgetting may actually be a useful component of brain function. In fact, I would say that we could probably consider to be forgetting to be the shadow of learning um, and maybe quite important for understanding creativity and the neuroscience of creativity. So when we consider forgetting in general everyday life, whether you're somebody going into middle life, 
who is starting to see that they forget things a lot more than when they were in their 20s, or whether you're going into later life and you're starting to experience um, early cognitive symptoms of dementia, which one third of us who live to be over 65 will experience. You tend to see forgetting as a nuisance, as, as a problem. Um, and as an inevitable cost of an imperfect brain, we learn things all the time, but we can't hold on to them all perfectly. And indeed, we put our young people, our adolescents, through a great deal of suffering uh, so that they can remember pretty arbitrary facts perfectly. And this then decides their life prospects. And it's all based on an assumption that forgetting is something that is bad and forgetting is a nuisance and forgetting, you know, it's, it's a weakness. Um, but the other way of looking at forgetting is that it's not a bug of the brain, but it's a feature of the brain. In fact, a very important feature of the brain. If we don't forget things, then we will get overly rigid, overly specific, and overly intransigent on how we deal with the world based on our initial experiences. And our initial experiences may be quite random and incidental and meaningless. Uh, but if they misdirect you and you don't change them, you're going to find that you don't adapt very well socially. Um, and, it's, and things aren't going to be the most adaptive for uh, your, your behavior is not going to lead to the most adaptive outcomes in your environment. And this was illustrated by a conceptual piece written by Blake Richards and Paul Franklin, two colleagues of mine in 2017, where they argued that letting go of information allows you to form more generalized, rough memories, which are actually more adaptive uh, for navigating your environment. And this example here uh, illustrates this with, if you want to find a particular restaurant in a particular city, if you know exactly where you need to go, maybe that's useful, but your location is gonna change, how you approach it is gonna change, so it's better to have a general schema, a generalized schema for how to find that information. Um, and so if you, and if you don't let go of that information, what will happen in future is you're going to spend too much time taking inefficient paths to find the location of your goal. Now, there's a problem with that view, which is that although it is useful to imagine that you would generalize, the cost is that you lose the information. The cost is that so that I can form more generalized schema, and so maybe I can think more creatively, I will then lose the information that I learned, which actually might be quite valuable to me in the future. Recent research in neuroscience has provided insights that may allow us to reconcile um, how we deal with the cost-benefit <laughs> analysis of, of forgetting or of generalization. And this work wasn't done in humans, but in rodents. A great deal of neuroscience relies on the ethically orientated experimentation uh, with animal models. And the reason that we can do this is because, unlike language, most mammals have the capacity for memory and forgetting. And the brain regions that are involved in memory and forgetting in rats and mice are very much the same in structure and in molecular makeup as they are in humans. And so we've been studying as a field the memory process in rodents for about 50, 60 years now. But 10 years ago at MIT in Boston, uh, a group of researchers of which I was privileged to be a part of managed to develop a way of labeling and manipulating particular engram cells in the brains of awake behaving mice. In other words, what we found we could do was to genetically label the particular memory engram cells in the brain and then turn them on and off using optogenetics, which basically means we turn on and off brain cells using fiber optics that deliver laser light to the brain. And using this technology, we found that we could, for want of a better term, implant false memories into the mouse, activate memories, and, and, and learn about the neurobiology of, of memory while doing so. And one early study that relates to forgetting was where we applied this technology to the study of amnesia. Now, amnesia, broadly defined, means memory loss due to a particular cause, head trauma, drug abuse, aging, neuroinflammation, <coughs> stress. So it's a kind of forgetting, but it's a kind of pathological forgetting, if you like. Now, any given kind of amnesia or natural forgetting 
starts with a, a priori ambiguity, which is that we don't know whether the memory loss is due to the fact that the memory may be gone. In other words, the engram is missing, the book is burned, you're not getting it back. Or it may still be present in the library, but you just don't know where the book is. And these, obviously, if we need to, if we want to understand whether the information is there or not, we need to discriminate between these two possibilities. So we found that if we labeled engram cells in the mouse and then caused memory loss by natural forgetting or by amnesia due to drug use or by genetic induction of early Alzheimer's disease because mice get Alzheimer's too, that the memory was still there. So even though the animals behaviorally lost the memory, if we stimulated the engram cells in the brain, the information could still be retrieved. And then similar findings have been reported since then by neuroscience groups uh, around the world. And we're moving towards what I think is uh, a new conceptual framework uh, on the neurobiology of memory access. So rather than thinking about memory and for or learning and forgetting as a binary thing, either we have the memory or we don't, we can consider memory accessibility as a spectrum of, of access. So in the extreme case of memory loss, we would have late phase Alzheimer's disease or severe traumatic brain injury. C conditions where you would actually have holes in your brain and you're definitely not getting that memory out. And on the other extreme, you have hypernesia, um, abundant memory retrieval, the kind seen in certain kinds of savants uh, or after post-traumatic stress disorder, post-traumatic <coughs> stress disorder. And in between, you would have a very rich spectrum of different degrees of memory access. And in the middle, we have natural forgetting. And the perspective that I'd like to offer is that the reason that we have natural forgetting, the reason that we have the, the nuisance of everyday forgetting, is not simply because we form a memory and then it degrades with time, or we form a memory and the ball is rolling down the hill. Um, in order to generalize randomly. But that what is actually happening is our brain is picking up signals from the environment. And the rate of forgetting that we experience for a given memory, whether it's a memory of a person or a book we've read or a sport that we've learned to play or an episode in our life, that the rate at which we forget that is caused by the events that happen to us afterwards that relate to how that memory is structured in our brain. In other words, the memory accessibility is modulated by the predictability of our environment. And what our brain is trying to do is optimize the level of predictability that it is able to do in order to enable adaptive behavior. And I think this is quite intuitive to me as somebody entering middle age. Uh, in that we, we, we enter a period of very obvious natural forgetting in our late 30s and early 40s, even though no one would describe that as being pathological or problematic. Um, and it seems to me that, well, I hope it's because we're getting better at managing uh, information and our, that our brains are getting better at managing the information that's important um, at recombining it and at selecting those which have useful predictive value uh, for the future. On the issue of, of creativity, we have to be creative beings in the moment, but there are only so many options that are available to us at any one particular point in time. A chimpanzee and a typewriter can be very creative in the sense that it will produce something unique after half an hour of, of, of banging on those keys. But creativity, and I think in the human sense, needs to be looked at through an evolutionary perspective, which means we need diversity. We need the capacity to create new things, but we also need selection. We need the ability to decide what is useful uh, according to rigorous <laughs> criteria. And it seems to me that having a balance of learning and forgetting that is modulated by the predictive value by the threshold by the predictive value of that information, of that change in your engram with respect to the environment um, is one way of explaining how we can be creative with our memories 
uh, that would result in a process that we would call as humans to be uh, imagination. Um, and I'm often asked uh, in public forum, what is the material basis? What do I think the material basis of, of memory is? Uh, I don't think that information in our brains is stored in any sort of biochemical or chemical or genetic mechanism. But I also don't think that it's mystical or, or vitalistic. I think that we need to be considering information in the brain as being an interaction between us and the world. And that like with many types of art forms, um, we, we've heard about Kadinsky earlier on today, but I think particularly so with people like Marcel Duchamp is that we learn the piece of art is only complete when the viewer interacts with it. Mm -hmm. And that the artistic experience is about the interaction of the viewer with the piece of art. And I think that's how memory works too. I'm of the view that um, the memory is about the interaction of the engram in the brain with the world around it. And I like to illustrate this with this photograph of a sculpture at MIT, um, which is a hundred gold-plated neurons suspended by the ceiling, suspended from the ceiling. And if you climb the stairs and you look at this from a very particular angle, uh, this is what you see. Um, and I like to ask, uh, my neuroscientist friends, you know, where is the information here? Is it, is it in the neuronal connections? Is it in the gold? Is it, is it inside the brain cells in some kind of molecule? Um, or is it in an activity pattern? Of course, there's no activity. This is, this is a latent structure. Um, and, the, and the reality is that the information is in the arrangement, but the information only exists from a certain perspective. Um, this, this is the basic question that we try to investigate in my lab at Trinity College Dublin. And just to acknowledge the people who work in my lab and uh, the people who fund our work. And thank you very much for your attention. So uh, Brian invited me to say a few things on on a different view of creativity. What we heard is three different versions of, of creativity. One that Richard talked about, about creativity in painting and in art in particular. Then there was creativity that Augustine talked about in the performing arts. And Tomas referred to creativity in the context of creating, of creating and using memories. So I'd like to talk about briefly about a different form of creativity, which is, um, I guess one definition is during during problem solving and during interactions, the kind of thinking that you do. So one form is thinking and acting with sort of uh, with uh, defocused attention. So rather than focusing on a very specific small uh, issue that's being under discussion, you actually operate in a much wider associative mode where there are multiple associations coming up at the same time, <clears throat> rather than focusing in an analytical mode where you're thinking in a single kind of a way. So, the, creative, so the, create, the creativity is used for problem solving involves both the, uh, the broader defocused mode where multiple associations are being brought up and then to focus down more closely with useful things that come up from that mode of thinking into an analytical mode that allows you to zero in and solve a problem. So the, I would say that the unique aspect of creative thinking is really how broadly one can engage this defocused and associative mode. And so uh, I was talking to uh, Sarah O'Mara at the back who referred to, uh, who, who referred to playfulness. So, so comedians, for instance, or during play, there is a sort of a defocused mode where the, the range of possibilities and associations to the topic you're thinking of is incredibly broad. Um, Richard referred to Kandinsky and, uh, uh, to Kandinsky and, um, um, what was the condition again? Uh, synesthesia. And synesthesia, where essentially synesthesia essentially is connections existing between parts of the brains that are not normally connected at all. So it's another way in which you get into a creative mode where you connect up issues which are not normally connected in an analytical mode of thinking. Ian Robertson, who has mentioned multiple times that people who are multicultural or people who speak multiple different languages tend to be more creative. So the idea then is that there are multiple paths to communicate the same information, 
and there are multiple ways in which one can perform exactly the same kind of a task. So that kind of training then allows one to essentially engage a much more associative and different modes of operation to on a single kind of a problem. So in terms of, um, and this also fits with what Richard was talking about, which is sometimes after a stroke, one suddenly can rediscover or, or learn a different way of operating where you suddenly are capable of doing some things that are inhibited. This brings me to the last point. Tomas mentioned that memories are stored by the activity of groups of neurons, which are called n-grams. So one of the ideas that have come out of some work in my group and with collaborators in Oxford in particular is that memories, which are multiple kinds of memories, are not just activated, but they're all held together. Each memory is actually kept silent by something which you call an inhibitory engram. So when you want to recall a memory, you not only activate it, but you also de you have to disinhibit so that you allow this group of neurons to be activated. So what you then need to do to have multiple different memories activated during sort of an associative mode of thinking is to have broader disinhibition so that different groups of neurons can be activated at the same time. And so I'd like to suggest that during creative kind of thoughts, one of the things that must occur should be broader levels of disinhibition so that different, thing, different sorts of memories can pop up. And then there is the aspect of connecting them up together and selecting the ones that are useful uh, for, the, for the final solution. Uh, there's, there's one last thing I'd like to say. Akira Kurosawa uh, is known to have said that uh, man, and I'd like to think he meant mankind, not boys, man is a genius when he's, man, man is a genius when he's dreaming. So one of the things that happens during dreams is that many memories and many things pop up spontaneously. And one of the things we do in, in dreams is to try and connect them up with sort of a narrative. And that's probably the most extreme uh, example of creativity that we all experience on a daily basis. Thanks. Thanks, Manny, for that synthesis. I think we've got a few minutes. I would love to take some questions here from the, the audience in the room, and perhaps there are some questions online. So, question here and here. Okay, great. Are there any questions in the chat online? Go ahead. This is a very selfish question. Um, I'm an artist and I have brain damage, spe specifically damage to my parietal lobes, which for a time left me not drawing, not wanting to draw. I was able to recover that through listening to music, but it's left me with a fear of it disappearing again. What can I do to keep the skill? Wow. Which um, <laughs> okay. First of all, I'm, I'm glad it came back. Um, secondly, I would keep doing it, um, is the, the first thing I'd suggest. Um, and I'd maybe on a word of encouragement, I'd, I'd suggest that I don't think it's likely to go away again. Um, we've seen remarkable examples, like with Anton Raiderscheidt, where things can return after even catastrophic damage. And, and a sort of tangential anecdote, We've worked with a couple of synesthetes who had really interesting types of synesthesia. Um, the rare types of synesthesia where they both see colors when they hear music and also see colored auras around people. And in both of their cases, they lost their synesthesia. In one case, the guy who we worked with lost it for 11 years when he was on strong medications. But when he stopped, it came back again, exactly as it was before. And the the other participant, she lost it after she was hit by lightning, and she, she's the unluckiest person I've met. She had multiple concussions, had viral meningitis, was hit by lightning. Um, but again, after a recovery period, her synesthesia returned, and the colors mapped on to the same musical notes as they had before. So I think there's encouragement there that even if things go away, they can come back again. And if you want to keep keep it or reduce the chances of it going away, I would just keep doing it. I'd keep practicing and keep producing art. So question here, I think. Yeah, uh, hi. Um, yeah, I'm interested in kind of, um, I suppose, the gut and the neurons in the gut uh, in your stomach um, and where that comes into neuroscience. Um, the vagus nerve, the hormones get released. Um, 
Um, I'm also interested in a concept called the pain, the pain body. Um, and you mentioned, uh, Richard, like you mentioned, oh no, maybe it was Thomas, sorry, uh, forgetting, and the, the importance of forgetting, like post-traumatic stress disorder, and some memory plays a part in, in forgetting trauma. Um, so yeah, they're the kind of subjects which came up on the, in the notepad. Um, they're the two kind of areas I was kind of interested in. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think the, um, the nervous system within our bodies is something that is probably neglected by uh, a large part of neuroscience, what's going on below the neck. Um, I'm often struck when I ask students to write an essay on that, um, that they come back to me with very good models of everything they've read on what's going on in the gut nervous system. And the circuitry is more complicated than what I study for studying memory in, in the brain, uh, which, I f which I always find a bit jarring. And of course, the circuitry in the brain is, is far more complicated than the gut, of course. But we tend to reduce that to particular parts of the brain that we're interested in in order to make it manageable. And in comparison, the gut nervous system is really complex, and it does... Uh, regulate in many respects how we feel. Um, the, the interaction between our brain and our body is uh, a bi-directional thing. It, it's important because how, our, how we're responding to the environment needs to affect how we behave, but also how we feel in general affects how uh, we need to regulate our metabolism. So I think that it's important to think of the brain as um, part of an extended nervous system and that the way that it feels and acts is not just about the neural circuits, it's about where the neural circuits are embedded. At the same time, I don't think that there's much evidence to think that memories or forgetting happens uh, to a very large extent below the neck, except for, of course, motor memories and to a certain extent how we're able to learn how to do things with, 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 our, with our body. Um, yeah, it seems that most of how we should be understanding memory and forgetting is, is probably ha ha happening above the neck, but we still, we still don't know as much as we'd like to. I think I'm getting signals from the back here that we have to draw the session to a close, and I think I just want to thank the, the speakers for their perspect perspectives here in the room, but also for Augustine and Ryan. And just thank the uh, audience for their participation, for their questions. So thank you very much.